name is Veronica Douglas, and I manage a small business development program at HCC, and we are so excited to have you here with us today. You're going to be healing, hearing from Julie Irvin Hartman and Susan Repka, and they're going to be presenting on delivering dynamite presentations. We are actually going to take a deep dive into one of our solicitations that had an oral presentation on it, so you're in for a real treat. Um, also, I want to note that we have Deborah Aaron on with us. Deborah is the purchasing assistant for the small business development program and Deborah has played a vital role in setting up these webinars for us. Uh, we are going to send out a survey um, this week. Um, please take time to fill it out. The survey is going to give us some information on what other seminars we can offer to you. We want to continue offering virtual presentations, but we want them to be meaningful. So please respond to us and let us know. Um, a few other things before we begin. Um, the small business development program, we have a 35% overall small business goal. Uh, what that means to you is that we are tasked with spending 35% of our budget dollars with local small businesses. We invite you to visit our website, which I'll put up in the chat, as well as to sign up on our constant contact so you can stay in contact with us. Um, and also a very important note that I want to make to each and every one of you is that in order to do business with HCC, in order to receive receive automatic bid notifications, you'll need to visit our website and register as a vendor. I'll also put that up in the chat for you as well. It takes just a few minutes. Um, currently, we have four bids out um, on our website. If you go to the website, you can actively download and bid on these procurements. The first one is an RFP. It is for Cisco maintenance and support. The second one is an RFP for process mapping and communication development consulting services. The next one is an RFQ for facilities programming services. And the last one is an invitation for bid for culinary arts interior shell build out. I know we were very brief this morning, but Julie and Susan have so much to teach you this morning. So I am gonna turn it over to them. Thank you, Julie and Susan. Thanks so much, Veronica. We're just thrilled and it's an honor to to be a strategic partner with Houston Community College in the Small Business Development Program. And not only y'all's commitment, but our commitment to help and grow Houston's small businesses. And we're just we're thrilled and, and excited to have a great, great morning together. Our session today is gonna cover uh, delivering dynamite presentations. And we've all been doing virtual presentations for a little over a year now. But we felt it was important to kind of pause because who knows how much longer we're going to be doing this and make sure that everyone has all of the tools, the resources, and the knowledge to deliver dynamite presentations. So we are going to talk about how you virtually present to Houston Community College. Like Veronica said, we're going to go through an actual vending RFP. We're also going to talk about presentation design and delivery techniques because anyone can just communicate your content, but only you can deliver a compelling and dynamic message. We're also gonna talk about mistakes that will cost you the contract during your presentation. Unfortunately, we are only limited to 90 minutes, so this session is not a click-by-click -click PowerPoint class. We are gonna show you some places to go in PowerPoint, but we're not gonna click-by-click. -click. Uh, like I said, we don't have enough time to cover everything that you need to know about virtual presenting. We're just hitting all of the highlights. And also, this is not a guarantee for a contract with Houston Community College. We are thrilled that they're our sponsor, um, but unfortunately, you can't say you went to this session, so I should get a contract. So we want to have the best webinar experience together. So Julie and I are co-presenting today, as you can see. So when one of us is here, uh, the other one is over there monitoring the chat. So you please, please ask your questions. Um, we're gonna make sure that we cover them all. This is an engaging session. Um, we're, kind of, we're kind of fun to be around. We're gonna show you some of the tools that you can use immediately to help you as you prepare your next presentation. And we have plenty of time for questions. You know, ask in the chat. Um, we have some specific questions we're going to be asking you. So we want you to listen and participate when we ask a question. We want to hear your answer back in the chat. 
it helps us as we continue on with the presentation. So and when we're finished, we want you to test drive some of these ideas and provide your feedback to us and share and celebrate those successes. We want to hear when you've just nailed that presentation. So today is meant to inspire you. So please participate. It's going to help you prepare for your next for you on your next HCC contract. It's going to grow your business and make a difference in the world. So we're going to go through our content today in three primary categories. We're going to talk about the HCC's procurement process overall and how an oral presentation fits into that. The second section is in regards to preparation practice and the actual presentation itself. And then at the end, we're going to talk about deal killers as well as bloopers. If you're able to turn your camera on, we'd love for you to do that. You'll continue to be muted until we open those up, but we really want to see your faces. We want to make sure that we're connecting with you and that we're keeping you engaged through this entire presentation. Susan's one of my favorite people on the entire planet, and she's dedicated her entire career to growing and advancing small businesses. She celebrates more than 30 years of marriage to her husband, John, and they live on an acre in Hempstead with three dogs and 30 chickens. They have seven grandkids and they keep them quite busy between baseball games, fishings, art projects, and their infamous pancake breakfast. So Julie is one of my favorite people. <laughs> I've known her for a number of years. I was, um, I did her first site visit when she had her award winning marketing company. Um, and we have worked together in one way or the other since that very first meeting. She was amazing. She's an amazing business owner. She's been a mentor and a friend. So after she sold her business, she and her trampoline jumping sheepdog, whom you'll meet later on, um, moved out to the suburbs where she got married and she has now three bonus sons. If you can't find her, she's on a ski slope somewhere, which when you live in Texas is not always that easy to do. <laughs> All right, so let's start with a polling question. As Julie is going over to the chat to get your answers. How many of you have completed a virtual presentation for any government entity last year? If you have, how many and which agencies? So one of Stephen Covey's famous quotes is begin with the end in mind. Any time that you submit an RFP or an RFQ response to any government entity, you need to assume that you will be shortlisted and start working on your presentation. So every company, again, the end that you want to be at is to get this letter that says you've been awarded a contract. We're, you know, we're going to start the negotiation process. This is the destination of this journey, but where does it start? So the RFP hits the street. Now this is the RFP that we are using today as an example. Now this is an, just an example. Every uh, RFP is going to be a little bit different, but we had to start somewhere. So you need to keep in mind that this is not a quick process. The life cycle of this particular RFP was 10 months from start, from the release date to the award date. 10 months seems like a very long time. Now, often they go through their life cycle on a little bit faster pace. I've actually seen them take longer. A client that would receive notification that they won an RFQ 18 months after it was submitted. This is it's a multi-stage process. It takes time. Be patient. So you might be wondering, how, well, how do you get this invitation to present? Like not every person that submits 
their response to an RFP is going to get this invite to present. But first off, you have to have one of the highest scores, whether it be the top three or the top five. Your response needs to be right up there at the very, very top. HCC provides your scorecard. This is how you are going to get scored on your proposal. So, you know, after after the uh, RFP is on the street, then you are responsible for the next steps. You need to make sure that you have done everything that you possibly can to get one of those highest scores. Now, actually, in this in this particular RFP, it clearly states that the the orient, oral presentations may be held and that each proposer should be prepared. Again, they're telling you at the beginning to prepare for this. Why would you assume that you're not going to make it to the stage, right? So you get this, you, you know, you've done, you submitted a high scoring proposal. Now you're getting this email, congratulations. You're one of the firms that will be, have the opportunity to present. So you need to go out, celebrate your success, whether it's a margarita or a blizzard, Julie and I've done both, but now it's time to get back to work. You have a short window in order to create your proposal, your presentation and prepare to present. And that's why you start early. So this needs to be a top priority for your company. You should treat this like a billable client, dedicate the time that you need. So why are you know, why are you presenting? They, they need a better understanding of certain um, aspects of your company and the proposal you, that you submitted. How long do you have to present? 55 minutes. Now, 55 minutes may sound like a long time. It's not. But I will tell you that at 55, at 54 minutes, you need to be wrapping up your presentation, right? Let's get it done. Um, and you need to ensure that all of the information that you're following the guidelines and in, in order to have a presentation that meets their needs. Let's do some homework after you've submitted. Your, after you've presented your presentation, you need to submit your best and final offer as well as your revised response. So you need to start working on that as you're doing your presentation. Make sure that you have all of that information by the deadline. You've already spent time on your proposal. You're spending time on your presentation to so make sure you have everything submitted on time. So read the information that they're sending you, reread this email, highlight any information that you need to make sure that you have and time block. Make sure that you have the deadline, the day you're gonna present, when you're going to be working on this presentation, if you're not blocking the time, you're going to wake up the day before and realize you don't have it together. Time block. If you have additional presenters, subcontractors, or other team members that will be a part of the presentation, make sure they have that time blocked. And just like the RFP, you need to ask questions. You need to find out anything that you don't understand and don't wait till the day before you're supposed to present to send in your questions to the buyer. 
um, don't wait or, or worse, even worse, the day of. If you, if you wait that long, then you're not going to have time to prepare that presentation or pivot it if it needs to be pivoted. So you should get a team specific email with the date and time that you're presenting, the link that you need to go to, the platform that you're that you will be using, as well as how early you can log in. And if they want specific team members at that presentation, or if you can bring additional uh, people as part of the presentation. So who are you presenting to? HCC's evaluation committee. Keep in mind that they are listening to multiple presentations, often back to back with only just a five minute break in between. We all know that virtual communication matters, but it's hard. You still need to make that connection with the evaluation committee. It's up to you to deliver. It's up to you, your content, your design and your delivery to convince them to award your company that contract. So where do you start? The content. You need to have all of the content of your presentation before you start anything else. Start with a power statement, grab their attention. I understand your problem. This is how I can assist HCC. The great thing about it is HCC, again, makes it easy for you to structure your content. They want your company to address very specific areas. This is not a generic sales presentation that you've used over and over. This is not what this is. HCC has their format, their questions. They tell you what to present. They provide you with that roadmap. That you need to follow it. As you're putting your slides together, you don't need to put the question on your slide. You put that in your notes. What you need to do is showcase your answer, provide the support of your content that you are delivering. So how do you make that happen? Again, HCC makes it easy. They have five sections. Now this is the structure for the vending machine RFP, but this is gonna be very similar to any other oral presentation for HCC on any other RFP. So they're, you know, they have section A, section B, section C, section D, and tab six. So follow their outline. So you might, you should probably thinking right about now, how long does this take for me to gather all of this information? The answer to that question is how important is it to your company? So first find the answers to the questions. Take the questions, sit down, write them out. I'm old school, I like to write my answers. Um, type them up on your computer, whatever it takes, but find the answers to every question that they are asking you. Then write your script. First draft, second draft, you know, you're gonna be you're going to be updating it as you move along. But start out, write, write that script. It's not until after you have written your script and, and got it at probably the 80% mark that you're gonna even start developing your slides. You don't wanna develop the slides then write the script. That's, you need to, to write the script, have an idea of what's going to go on each slide. One thought, one question per slide. Slides are free. Then practice, practice, practice. You should have practiced this presentation so often that you are super comfortable doing this. Also, if you have more than one person presenting, you should practice it so often that you know when the next slide should come up 
when the other person speaking so you're not doing the dreaded next slide please so be comfortable you also need to be so comfortable that you can present the other person's information just in case there's some uh technology issues julie and i've had to flip slides before because you know one of us got booted off and all of a sudden you know you do my part i'll do yours i gotta get back online so practice and then show time. So that's you know you're you you are standing up. You're doing your presentation virtually. All right. So Julie is going to come up and she's going to talk about um, the next three sections. So the first section oh. that HCC wants to talk to to have you talk about is section one, and this is the firm's qualifications and experience and demonstrated qualifications of the personnel and the team. And there's 11 questions that they would like for you to address. And make sure that you read these questions and that you understand the intent of what HCC is trying to get to, right? So then that helps you work on your content. Content is king. And then you can develop your slides. So we're actually going to, as we go through these sections, we're gonna show you some, uh, some slides of winning presentations that we hope inspire you as you go and create your scripts and develop your slides, practice, and deliver winning presentations. We can't, unfortunately, go through all 11 of these questions, so we're going to pick out four. And, and the reason why we're picking out these four is because they're typically industry and product agnostic. These types of questions you have probably answered already in your RFP response. And if you didn't, then you need to make sure that you address them in your presentation. So it doesn't matter what you're proposing or submitting. You're more than likely going to be asked these types of questions in one way or another. So the first question talks about your capability and your capacity. Your opening statement and opening slide should be a power statement, like Susan said, and most importantly, it should get the evaluator's attention. We've all sat through a ton of not only in-person presentations, but virtual presentations that start something like this. Hello, my name is Julie Hartman. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing us to be here and present our qualifications for the Moberly Complete Street Project, right? So if you've sat through something like that, put that in the chat or raise your hand. What I encourage and challenge each and every one of you to do is to turn that into a power statement. Do something like this. Good afternoon. Our team is excited and honored to be considered for the city of Longview's first complete street. It's a high profile project and success is the only option. Our team, individually and collectively, has been delivering successful projects, including bond projects, on time and within schedule for the city of Longview for more than two decades. Now, you let me know through the chat which speaker you would like to see when they open up and talk about their capability and capacity, the normal opening or the power statement opening. Second, exactly, right? The next question that you need to make sure to address is roles and responsibilities. Now, this is the project team. These are the people that were in the RFP, but most importantly, these are the people that are going to be doing the work. This is not your bookkeeper or your admin. These are the people that will be doing the work. And I know I just repeated myself. These are also the people that are going to be a part of the presentation. All righty, and so the two, um, the two gentlemen up at the top, Joe Hart and Kevin, they were actually there in person, and then the rest of the team was virtual. We did a total of six, six full rehearsals for this 45 minute presentation, right? Because we had people all over the nation that we had to hand off to. So it needed to make sure that it was fluid. And this was a five year project. So there was a lot at stake. And I'd like to report that they won it. All righty, differentiators. You got to be able to have a differentiator. And we're gonna go through two different types of differentiators. One of as an owner and then two as a company. 
And this is our great friend, Chef Yo. And I tell you what, she is exactly what makes her company unique, right? So she's got this amazing personality and she cooks with gas. And every time you hear her talking about herself or her company, you can hear her passion. And so she has this slide up every time that she tells her story about her journey from Louisiana to Houston and why she named the company after her grandma. She doesn't read all of that information, very similar to what Susan and I did when we did our opening. Differentiator in regards to your company, right? So you can use examples that are quantitative, which means they deal with numbers. And as you can see, this visual supports my script and it's not going to be my script. So we're gonna talk about the thousands of attendees and participants that have attended hundreds of virtual meetings and sessions, right? You get the gist right there from that slide. COVID, it's, it's where we are and it's where we're gonna probably be for a while. You've got to be able to communicate your COVID protocol program. And we know that that varies depending on what industry you are and it might even vary depending on the type of product or service that you provide. HCC wants to know about your COVID protocols. And most importantly, they want to ensure that doing business with you keeps their students, their staff, and their faculty safe. Here's an example of Chef Yo's protocol program. Section B, we've got nine questions in section B. And as Susan showed you, um, section B comes from page three of four in those presentation email instructions. Section B addresses products and pricing, fairness, reason reasonableness of the proposed cost. Alrighty, I can't show you anybody's pricing that's proprietary, but when we can talk about is the types of things that you need to address and think about when you're crafting your company's pricing, righty? So we've got to talk about competitive pricing. You've got to talk about your pricing commitment and comment on whether it's industry standard. Everybody's in business here, right? We know that you're going to make a markup. HCC wants you to make a profit because if you're profitable, then you can continue to do business with HCC. Once again, you want to tell them that the pricing that you submitted was based on similar projects of size and scope. We did this project for apples, but that was red apples, but these are green apples. And you know what? It's very, very close and similar, right? So we know that the pricing is accurate. If what you do involves guarantees or warranties, you need to make sure to let them know that they are or are not included in your pricing, as well as if you're having a, a specific type of technology that HCC is requiring or that is critical for you to do business operations, whether those technology costs are or are not included in your pricing. Section C. Past performance and references. They want here is they want to talk about and know the quality and reliability of the vendor's proposed services. And we've got two questions here. And the biggie is the one that we're going to spend and, and give you some examples on here. Most important, similar size and scope that you've completed. They want to know if there were some lessons learned what your significant contributions were, and were there, were there things your firm could have done better, right? So focus on the similarities in scope, right? So here's an example of, of a civil project, and they're talking about civil considerations. And so this project wasn't an exact fit, but there were definitely some components that were the same. So our narrative is going to talk about the efficient and safe flow of traffic, efficient and safe pedestrian flow, parking, water service, wastewater management, all righty? So there were other things that they did in this project, but connect the dots for the evaluator, connect the dots and, and have them understand that you've done this before. 
that that if they go with you, the risk is low for error. And once again, success is the only option. We talk a lot about team and a team is a prime as well as subcontractors. And I think it was Myra in the chat put that she was a she's a subcontractor on a team that did a presentation and had and won a, and a, won a contract. So your experience as a subcontractor counts. So this is how we visually presented the entire team's summary of relevant experience, right? So you've got the, the reference projects as well as the team members across the top. Lessons learned. Every project isn't perfect. I'm going to say that again. Every project isn't perfect. And we grow individually, professionally, as well as an organization when things aren't easy, right? We grow when we face challenges. And so talk about it, talk openly about it. And what's great is Houston Community College or whatever government entity that you're presenting to is going to benefit from your lessons learned. So here's a photo of a, of a project, and then we talk about the lessons learned. That we, we learned that we need to do a debrief after every project closeout. We need to have a little bit more improved communication between the subs and the primes, as well as the end client. We're gonna customize and update the process a little bit better. And from the beginning of the project, maybe, maybe a, a better understanding of everyone's expectations. And that's why we did that slide in the beginning um, we talk about what somebody can expect of us and what we can expect of you. And now Susan's going to come and do a couple more sections. All right, so now let's talk about section D, proposed net sales and commission rate. You can find this on page three of the four of the um, presentation instruction email. They have six questions they would like you to answer. <clears throat> So let's talk about the value added of goods and services that are not included in the price and your flexibility. So we're gonna take those two questions and show you some <laughs> samples of some slides that would address those. So this particular company is trying to do business with HCC. And the one thing that they understand is how important it is to HCC, HCC to not disrupt their normal business operations. They have students that are in class. They have faculty that are either in class or have, um, you know, in their office waiting for students to come in and meet with them, as well as they have staff that are trying to run the business of HCC. This particular company has stated that they are willing to work nights, weekends, holidays, off hours, so that they can ensure that the project is successful, that it is completed in time and it stays on budget. So that is an added value to HCC. They're not going to have extra people running around the school that, is, that are disrupting all of the classes. So take a moment, how can your company provide added value to HCC. Maybe that's if your product needs delivered. Can you guarantee that delivery in 24 hours? Can you deliver to all campuses free of charge? Do you have additional team members that are available in as HCC grows and the contract grows? Maybe the team members are thought leaders in that industry, and they can provide valuable insight to HCC. So all of those can be added value. So how can your company add added value to HCC on the last RFP that you um, responded to? So now let's talk about flexibility. Every company has their standard approach, their standard process of how they do the work. But what happens if the company that you are working with decides they need to put this on a fast pace? How are you able to respond? 
So this is a sample of how this particular company was able to answer that call from TxDOT. We need this design in five weeks. All hands on deck. They brought in additional team members that weren't part of the original project. Let's get together. Let's make sure that they, this gets done. They worked weekends. They worked, you know, in the evenings um, in order to get this at the 30, 60, 90 mark, um, in order to get this completed in the five week timeline that TxDOT had given them. So the next section we're going to cover. So one of my favorite, of course, it's the small business practices. How are you, how, what is your um, history with small businesses and how are you going to use your subcontractors on this particular project? You can't just put their name in, on the sub small con, on the small business forms and say, oh, we're going to use them. You need to show how you will use them. Here's a sample slide on this. This is divided by the discipline. Each discipline clearly marks which of the companies will be performing that particular service. Now there are several, you know, there's the, the prime is an, has an architect as well as there's some, um, a sub that has architecture. So all of the subcontractors listed, it clearly states where they fit in this project. So now you want to show some history. Oh, so how have you been working with small businesses? So here we have, this is our proposed numbers. This is the total utilization. They have knocked this out of the ballpark. They exceed their goals time and time again. Here's another example of exceeding the expectations of the small business goal. 35% small business goal, 99.5 total as small business usage. Again, we've knocked it out of the ballpark. We have a history of exceeding small business goals. All right, before we get into the next section, I have a question for you. What are the, the average number of virtual meetings that you've had to participate in a day during 2020? So as you're putting in those answers for Julie, let's talk a little bit about the audience of a virtual presentation. Default setting, boredom. It's up to you as the presenter to deliver the most interesting and engaging presentation. You have to get their attention and keep it. Now keep in mind, they've sat through several presentations. Now they've gotten up, they've gotten their coffee, they're ready for you. Let's keep them focused. So you as the audience, see Julie and I, as we're presenting, we're standing in front of our neutral background, doing our thing. And these are the tools that we use. Now you're not gonna need to go out and buy every one of these tools for that one presentation. But if you do multiple um, Zoom calls, team calls as part of your business, you probably want to think about a few of these tools. Um, we use the big ring light. But there's also smaller lights that you can use. Uh, a remote. Let me tell you this remote. Game changer. You're not doing the whole lean over and changing the slides. Oh, we have a laptop stand to make the laptop at the right height. Let me tell you something. If you have an old dictionary, some old books, stack it up. Now, I'm going to do a little selfish plug here. Um, if you don't have an Amazon Smile account and you would like to donate a portion of what you spend at no cost to you to a nonprofit, um, Focusing Family, 
uh, would be one I would like you to consider. They work with victims of domestic violence and violence and sexual assault. And it's a little selfish. I do serve on their board. Now, this is what Julie and I see as we're standing here presenting. You have a ring light, we have two monitors, and all the way across the room is the computer that we use for the chat. So that's why there's a slight delay as we switch places because one of us is moving out and moving, you know, and just moving across the room. So not quite what you would expect in a studio studio, but this is our studio. This is how we work. Now, where's your camera? It's a very important question that you need to know. Where's the camera? Where's the microphone? And where are your notes? So we put the notes on the computer with the, the camera so that we are looking at the camera. As you put them on the side, you're going to get the side view. You want to wipe my ears? Um, camera should be higher than eye level. Really about your eyebrow is a good guide. Now, as you walk into the studio, this is what you see. And, and when we're done, there may be some yoga going on and with our little yoga mats hanging on the wall. Now, the remote that I showed you is less than $50. Now, please, please test it before the big presentation. If this is a presentation to HCC and it's going to win or lose a contract, mm -hmm. change out the batteries that morning. All right, Julie is going to talk about practicing. We practiced this presentation a minimum of six times. We had a technical rehearsal and we had a content rehearsal. We had a slide rehearsal and practice is is where the content and, and the delivery come come together. And in our first rehearsal looks a lot like that first light bulb. We're jumbled. OK, Susan, are you going to say this? OK, I'm going to say that. Oh, but we can't forget this. And, and it's it's a little clunky, right? Because you're you're getting the thoughts down, right? And and sometimes what you write on a script and what you end up saying uh, might end up being different. And you need to to practice practice actually talking through the presentation, not just reading. So you can work on that. You can work on your timing. So repeated rehearsals, plenty of fine tuning. You end up like that light bulb, right? You've got that nice line. You're you're bright. You're clear. You're concise. You're compelling, and and you get to keep their their attention. And um, if you follow Susan and I on social media, um, we were posting some of our pictures of our rehearsals, and they and they were quite comical. We'll give you our social media information um, at the end of the session as well, uh, so you can have that if you don't already follow us. Um, you can afterwards. So. Practice, 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 right? And so there's a couple different ways in PowerPoint to practice. And so when you are practicing your presentation, you can go in to slideshow. And when you do that and you use presenter view um, and you make sure that the checkbox is checked, um, this is what Susan and I see. And what a lot of people don't know is that you can actually modify the presenter view. So I can make this side smaller. If you wanna see the slide that's coming up, uh, you can do that as well, or you can do this. Now, the one thing that I really love about presenter view, and keep in mind, you only get presenter view if you have two monitors. And monitors are cheap. You can get an extra monitor for like $99 but you can make your notes, whether that's a full script or if maybe these are just your talking points, like right here, you can see that this is my reminder to switch screens because I needed to switch the screen so y'all can see what I see on the screen. Now you would never wanna present with this view, but this is what you're gonna want to, to have on the computer where that camera is, right? So when you're looking at your notes, are glancing at them, you're still looking at the camera. We've all sat through these presentations where you're seeing a side profile of, of people's face. That is not what you want to do. So 
how do you get to presenter view? In the slideshow tab, you can go all the way over to the third group. And this box right here, use presenter view, must be checked. And then it lets you choose which monitor you want it to be on. The primary monitor is going to be your computer and then your secondary monitor. So you can um, click on the drop down and, and change that. So now your notes are on the camera and the slide is what people see. So here's an example of Chef Yo and in a presentation and people are, you know, want to know, um, how awesome you are and maybe your mom isn't there to tell them right have a customer tell them put a customer testimonial up on a slide and as you can see we've highlighted keywords keywords that are critical to hcc critical to to that partnership and that establishment and critical to what specifically chef yo's customers hcc and heb wanted and how she exceeded their expectations. Excuse me. Here's another example of, of a slide here, and we're going through different phasing plans and we're talking about the constant communication that's gonna be happening on this project. And we're also gonna be talking about the multiple phases that are occurring at the same time. Here's another slide example. You might be asked to talk about your approach so here it is, we've got a six phase approach, initial planning, then we're gonna do the summary. We're going to conduct um, an SRMP, we're gonna prepare, and then we're gonna finalize. So walk people through the steps. People are visual, they want to see visuals, not words. All right, another way to practice is to actually use the rehearsed timings in PowerPoint. And as Susan said, HCC gives you 55 minutes to present an additional 25 minutes for Q&A. At 55 minutes, they're gonna say time, and then they're gonna open it up to Q&A. You cannot go over the time. So you need to know how long you're spending on each slide, as well as your overall time. Now. If you're fortunate, maybe your husband, or you can call a colleague over like Susan and I do, and, and have somebody critique you. And that's a luxury, but you may not have that. Or your schedule might be crazy, and the only time you have to present, I mean, to, to practice, is on the weekends or, or really late at night. So PowerPoint has two different tools that can help you practice when it's just you. And the first one is, Rehearse timings and rehearse timings is right up there in the slideshow toolbar and it's right there and you can see the icon right there. So that says rehearse timings. When you click that button, it takes you into slideshow on your first slide. And if I can have everybody look at the top left corner of your screen, you can see that the recording is there. So that's going to continue to change that will provide you the total amount of time that you've been talking so far, as well as the specific time allocated to that one slide. So you're gonna click through your slides and click through and talk and talk and talk. And then when you're done, you're gonna hit the escape button. And this screen comes up and it tells you that the total time for your show was a minute and 39 seconds. Do you wanna save the timing, the slide timings? And you wanna click yes here. Because when you do that, PowerPoint shows you in slide sorter view the exact amount of time that you spent on each specific slide. This is huge. This is huge. So if we know that we're going over and we tend to be a little um, wordy or maybe there's a slide that we're nervous on, we might be spending a little bit extra time on that. So now I can see which slides I'm going really fast through and which slides that I'm sitting on. And like Susan said, slides are free, so it's okay. There isn't a slide limit, nor should there ever be. Just as long as you're within the time constraints that you're given, take as many slides as you want. That also helps with memorization of the content. It helps move the presentation along and especially in virtual presenting. When a slide changes, you grab the audience's attention again, 
because if you sit on a slide for too long, they're going to go back to that default setting of boredom. Keep their attention. So we've got, and we know now which slides that, that we're moving along on. And so I can see that the intro was 57 seconds and I might need to slim that down a little bit because I need the intro to be right at one minute. So when I'm able to see the slides in slide sorter and you go to the transitions tab, you can see that on mouse click and after is selected. And the reason why the after checkbox is selected is because you have the times there. Now, when you're ready to rehearse again, and most importantly, when you're ready to actually do your presentation, you need to make sure that you've cleared out all of the timings or else PowerPoint's gonna change, um, change the slides for you. So select all of the slides, then click the on mouse click button, right? Because that means the slides will change when you click and make sure that the after is not clicked. All right, so I'm gonna say that one more time. So you're gonna select all of your slides. You're gonna click on mouse click to make sure that that has a checkbox in it. Then you may need to make sure by clicking and unchecking the after so your slides won't automatically advance. A really cool tool that is here in PowerPoint right now um, it, it was, it's been on the, uh, OneDrive version for quite a while, but now if you've downloaded a uh, PowerPoint or updated your PowerPoint within the last couple of months, you're going to get this awesome tool called presenter coach. Now, keep in mind, this is artificial intelligence. So some computer bot on the other side of the world, or maybe around the corner, who knows where all these AIs live is actually going to evaluate your presentation. So Julie, where do I go to get that? Well, you go back to the slideshow section where it says slideshow, and we're gonna move a little bit down and it says rehearse with coach. We're gonna click that button. And when that happens, it's going to start on the exact slide that you're on right there. And I'm rehearsing with my clicker because that's what I'm going to use when I present and a little button pops up on the bottom right-hand corner. And it says, see live feedback as you rehearse. And as soon as you click the button, start rehearsing, it's going to start a timer and that's gonna wake up the artificial intelligence on the other end of, of, of PowerPoint. So we're gonna click that and here we go. So we're on this slide and we're talking. And as you can see, uh, the presenter coach is right there giving you information and live feedback. If you say, um, 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 quite a few times or fillers, it's going to pop up and show you that. It's going to say, try not to use too many fillers like, um, and as you go through your presentation, it will coach you and give you little bitty feedback nuggets as you go along. It's not perfect. I'll, I'll say that, uh, but it's a great tool to help you rehearse and present. And when you present, make sure you're standing, make sure you're looking at the camera because it gives you this report when you're done. So here's your rehearsal report. And this is your rehearsal report for that run that you just finished. So I spent a total of 42 seconds. Maybe I was going back through my intro that my goal time was at a minute, 42 seconds between a minute that's telling me I'm talking a little too fast. Now I do have a life goal of being an auctioneer someday, so I really can talk really fast, but when you're doing a presentation, especially a virtual presentation, you don't really wanna be talking that fast, okay? So you probably wanna slow it down a little bit. And in 42 seconds, I went through five slides. Your pace, if you were talking really fast like I was, your pace is probably gonna be really fast. So keep in a nice pace, a nice conversational pace. It's okay to be nervous. It's even okay to pause every once in a while. Take a deep breath and collect your thoughts. Alrighty, so fillers, um, um, because, hmm, those types of things, it's gonna let you know that you said them. And your average pace overall, maybe some slides you're gonna talk a little bit faster on, some you might take talk a little slower. So it's letting you know what your overall pace is. 
if you turn your camera on when you're doing presenter coach, it's going to give you some uh, some critical feedback regarding camera positioning. And we're going to show you some really fun outtakes and bloopers um, as 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 towards the end of the presentation. But it lets you know if you're too close to the camera or if you're too far away. If your eye contact, remember, that's why you want your notes to be on the, the computer with the camera. So you're not looking away already. And there's even more additional information that that report can give you. And so go ahead and put in the chat. If you've ever used the rehearse timings, remember, that's the one that tells you how much time you've spent on each slide and your overall time. Or if you've ever used the presenter coach. And if you haven't used either of these, then let us know when you might want to be able to do that. If you have a presentation coming up. All right, Susan's going to come and talk about the environment. Hi. You may remember pre COVID. And you actually went and presented in this room. You had a nice little conference room. You had the screen at the top. You had all of this right there in front of you. And there were people in the room. Well, we can't wait to get back to that someday. But right now, this, this is our space. This is your audience. Keep in mind what they see is important. Cameras see all. Whether you're in your home office, your dining room, the spare bedroom, your office at your actual office, the camera can see everything. Now, there are some things that you can control. So that you're not one of those <clears throat> bad presentations that we've all seen. They need to clearly see you. Additional lighting is important for them to clearly see you. Now you saw from our tour of the studio earlier that we do have the big ring light. Presentations are something that we do on a regular basis. So this is, if this is the only one that you're doing, you might invest in a smaller light. But play around with that light and the position and the light settings and, and make sure that you have the right amount of light, but it's not showing the shadow behind you. Uh, make a note on how it's set. You can move it around, it can clip to the top, it can clip to the side. Spend some time getting that right. It makes a big difference in the way you appear on camera. So you can see we have, uh, we're standing in front of a window, but the curtains are blackout curtains and they are closed tightly. Because when you have the window open, you get this light from behind you and people can't clearly see your face. So 30, 45 minutes walking around the room or walking around your space to find the right lighting is important. Now, if you're doing the co-presenting and you're not as fortunate as Julie and I to be in the same, or if you're fortunate as Julie and I to be in the same location, make sure you're standing evenly if you are presenting at the same time. When one is closer to the camera than the other, there's a whole lot of one and the other one appears behind you and is a little smaller and kind of faded out, or you're not quite at the same height. And so you have this, oh, you only have this much of this person's face and you have this much of the next person. So make sure you're as close as possible to the same height. And if you've got a short person, what can you do? Well, here we are, we're close to the same height, but not in reality. I'm quite a bit shorter than Julie. So how do we kind of overcome that? This is our presentation footwear. 
So in order to adjust her height, Julie gets to present without any shoes on. Susan has to wear high heel boots. Now these are my presentation shoes. They stay here in a little basket underneath the laptop stand so that I have them when we're doing presentations. Now, one of the benefits of virtual presentations is waist up. Now, she's in yoga pants that, that particular day and I have on blue jeans and Adele has on her fuzzy socks. But that adjusts our heights so when we're standing side by side, I'm not like this to her. Now, the cameras are on your whole team. So Julie showed a um, slide with a team and during that particular presentation, two of them were actually at um, the facility and then the rest of the team was at their, in their offices with their cameras on. Now their cameras are on the entire time. They need to be engaged. You do not want your team member looking bored by your presentation. That, that's just not good. Or even worse, totally disengaged. I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm answering my phone. I'm checking my email. I'm sending a text. Yeah. If it doesn't matter to them, why should it matter to the evaluator? All right, so we talked about lights. Julie is going to talk about camera angles, and we have all seen these. Yes, so HCC wants to see you, right? And you need to be the center in, in the screen. And the camera needs to be able to focus on that. And we talk a lot about the team, right? Well, the ceiling fan is not a member of the team. So in this example, your computer is too low and the camera is pointing up, right? So that's why you're seeing the ceiling. So you've got to get some books or get a monitor stand and raise up that camera and then push your, your computer screen forward or adjust if, if you've got an ex external camera, adjust that as well. Alrighty, so we're trying to get Susan a little bit better and, 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 and we've got the computer up and we've got the screen tilted forward, but it's not quite appropriate for that. And we're also cutting off our head. All righty, well, we tried it again. We're getting a little bit better, but it's still too low. And, and once again, very similar to the ceiling fan shot, the, the screen is tilted too far back, but Susan's also way, way, way too close to, to the screen. So you want to have a nice, a nice shot, right? And, and I think a great way to get an idea of how you should be positioned in the screen, whether it's too close or too far, is to watch the news, right? So take a picture of, of the news and then have somebody work with you and, and help you, whether that's your son, your kid, a friend, your neighbor, um, to help you get that. And, and, and do that and get your, your lighting as well as your camera angles where they're going to be when you actually do that presentation, right? Maybe put tape on the floor or, or, or books or whatever, but figure out where those positions are for not only your computer, which has the camera, but as well as your light. All righty. Well, we see this a lot. Right, and, and the reason why you're seeing somebody's eyelids and they're looking down, most of the time it's because they have their notes printed out and they're reading them. So maybe if you're only limited to one screen, well, if, if you are, then maybe go get a stand. If you've got to have your notes next to you, then put them up here. So if you are reading your notes, they're at eye level. Eye contact is so critical over virtual presenting. People want to see your eyes. It's one of the few ways that we actually can continue to connect over this medium. So grab some old books or some magazines, stack up your computer, buy a monitor stand, or put your notes to, to, to the right or the left, but don't look down. Whenever you're looking down, then they're going to see your eyelids. 
standing. Make sure that you stand when you're doing a presentation, because if you were doing it in person in HCC's boardroom or in one of their, their meeting rooms in downtown Houston, you would be standing. So do that as well. When you sit and you present, you're more likely to lean forward. And when you lean forward, this is what happens. It makes your head look bigger than your body because the camera is focusing on the closest thing and it puts your body out of proportion, right? You look like one of those caricatures with your head is so much bigger than your body. Make sure that you're wearing what you would wear if you were going downtown, if you were in person, professional attire, a suit jacket, a sweater, professional attire, and make sure that you're addressing things that are behind the scenes, right? We've got just this nice neutral background. So look around your house, look to see where that neutral background might be. It might be in your dining room, it might be in your living room. It might be, this used to be our spare bedroom. And, and we sold all the furniture and converted it into my office. So think about where you're going to be presenting. Think about what you're going to be wearing. Think about your light. Think about the camera. And all of this plays a part of your environment and makes that first impression. You're going to be on a, an interview for, for 75 minutes with Houston Community College. So you need to make sure to be able to control as much as you can within reason within your environment. We understand that most everyone is working from home and, and things might happen, but be proactive and do what you can with the elements that we're talking about to control your environment. Background. We've all seen the, the, the alien background and the beach background and the, the library or the really nice cool modern office background. Use a background that would be appropriate for a professional interview. If it is not appropriate for a professional interview, don't use it. If you're not able to find a neutral background, like we've got these curtains or a wall or hang up a white sheet, then find a background. So this is Susan in front of her desk. This is where we work every day, right? Um, we've got some empty bottled waters. We were working on a proposal. So we've got some paper hanging and some books that we grabbed and we're using and referencing. So if you do end up using your day-to-day -day work environment, make sure that it's clean, make sure that it doesn't look disheveled. And, 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 and if you were going to invite Houston Community College into your office or to your home, that you wouldn't be embarrassed and that it's professional. Custom backgrounds. So we need to talk about those because everybody's using them. Don't get one that's super busy. This one is in a coffee shop. Would I go and present to HCC for a million dollar contract in a coffee shop? Probably not. So don't use a coffee shop background. And she's really hard to see, right? At first glance, she, she blends in and, and there's just a lot going on. The focus needs to be on you. Here's a good background. It's bricks, it's neutral. I can clearly see the difference between the background and the gentleman. Super easy to find them. The, the, the camera angle is great. The lighting is good. Um, I would prefer to see him in a jacket, but, but that's okay. Um, this is a good example of a good background. We talked about uh, that team presentation that, that we did. And you might have multiple people in multiple locations. If you choose a background, and you're gonna change it and make it custom, make sure that you wiggle around in it, make sure to see what happens when you do that, because you might end up like an alien, like the third guy here, I'm sorry, the fourth guy in this frame. And if you, if you chose a background, maybe your company says that you need to use their background or the prime contractor said everybody needs to have this background, which helps the whole team look much more cohesive and if you do some wiggling and stuff and, and, and you start morphing, then you've got to make sure that you stay in the same position. 
All righty. Once again, this goes back to that practice and that rehearsal. You've got to rehearse exactly how you would going exactly as if you were going to present. Custom backgrounds. If you've taken that extra, extra, extra step to develop a custom background, make sure that what the presenters see, I'm sorry, make sure what the attendees see is what you want them to see. So some platforms mirror it and some send it exactly out. So this specific gentleman thinks he can see his logo the correct way. Well, when Susan and I were on a call with him, this is what we saw. So their logo was, was mirrored and, and flipped, right? Another thing, this was a sales call and this, 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 this person in, 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 in didn't wear appropriate attire. He has a hoodie and a t-shirt that looks like um, it just was the top thing um, on his laundry basket. And that's okay. I've been living out of the top of my laundry basket for the last six months, but not when I'm on a sales call. And most importantly, not when I have a presentation. All right, let's talk about two-legged and four-legged family members. Most of us are not the only ones at home during the day. This is a 75-minute presentation. You're going to want to log on a couple minutes before. So let's just be reasonable and say this is about 90 minutes, right? Because you want to be in the zone a little bit before. Where are your pets? Are they going to be in the crate? Are they going to be outside? Are they going to be in the room with you? And if they are, that's a pretty big risk that you've got to be willing to take. So think about your two-legged family members. Also got to talk uh, talk about your, 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 your two-legged family members. We just talked about your four-legged ones. You've got to let other people in the house know that this is important. Maybe put it on your family calendar if you have one and, and put that time block so everyone knows between 10 and 1130, this is where I'm going to be. Put a note on the door. There's all these cute little notes out there and door hangers or signs that you can get um, to let people know. And, and even if you're back in, in an office, one of those few people, maybe you, you get one for your office door as well. Remind everyone that morning. Right, that I've got this big presentation. And if you're at home, then make sure to communicate that you should be the only one on the Wi Fi network during this session. Roadblocks, Minecraft, all of that other stuff can wait. When you're sending video over a platform, it takes up a whole lot of bandwidth. So make sure that you've got as much of the bandwidth in the environment as possible. Susan talked about that, that message that you're going to get uh, from HCC or any government entity and make sure that you know what platform they're going to use. There's tons of different platforms on there and each one has its own little ways. You might be using Google Hangouts all the time for your family, you know, to connect with your grandparents every Saturday or, or Facebook Messenger or Zooms or Teams or whatever, but that may not be the platform that HCC uses. So you need to know what platform it is, and then you need to make sure to rehearse on that specific platform. As we conclude, I'd, I'd love to, to go over this Malcolm Gladwell quote um, regarding, of course, practice. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing that you do that makes you good. And he's an amazing speaker. If you wanna see any of his TED Talks, um, you can either go to YouTube or Google him, but but I want to leave everyone with with that message. We know that these things work, and we encourage each of you to make a list, uh, make a list of some action items from the content that you've learned today. You've already committed an hour and a half of your schedule, so maybe not today, and maybe not this week, but within the next five to ten minutes. I challenge you to make an action item list and some of those things that could be on that list. Obviously, practice, practice, practice. Find a presentation partner, right? Whether that's a virtual presentation partner or an in person presentation partner. Maybe it's someone that's here in this chat that you just met today. Purchase the tools. 
Um, you could probably get all of these tools for around $150, but think about which ones you need. Think about which ones maybe you could borrow from someone, but have the right tools in your toolbox. Establish your virtual studio, whatever that means in whatever environment that you're able to have at home or in your office. If you're very interested in doing business with HCC, which I suspect you are because you're here today, you need to start gathering content. Start gathering content, regardless if you're doing an RFP, which will eventually end up with an oral presentation, or if you're interested in doing work in the government sector as a whole. Start gathering content on those types of things that we talked about. Talk about your capacity and your capabilities. Talk about your team's experience. Think about projects that are the same and similar to the types of thing that Houston Community College is going to be purchasing. Talk about and start thinking about content regarding your differentiators, those types of things. And if you don't have slides that communicate those exact things, then go ahead and start creating them. At least getting things down if you need Susan and I to look over something, then go ahead and reach out to us. Now, in regards to HCC specific action items, there'll be a session survey that comes out after our time together. Add that to your action list. So you're gonna have your action items and make sure to complete the survey. Veronica and her team take these surveys very seriously. And how you respond to these surveys sets the course for additional webinars and additional support for you and your business from Houston Community College. That's how this course got developed. All righty. Sign up for their newsletter. Go to the, the procurement page that I put in the chat earlier and you can sign up for their newsletter. If you are not an HCC vendor, make sure to register. If you are an HCC vendor, go in and review your profile. Maybe there's some things that you've started doing in the last couple of months that you haven't done previously. Update that. Alrighty, and then make sure to check your inbox for the recording of today's session. That will be coming from Deborah, just like all of the other communications have been coming from Deborah as well. Here's our contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us via social media or directly through our emails or even our phone numbers. And we are here to help and support each and every one of you, not only to do business with Houston Community College, but to grow your companies, be successful, and do business with any entity that you would like. And at this time, we're going to turn it over to Veronica so she can open it up for questions and answers as well as closing comments. And thank you, Julie and Susan. I found that to be extremely informative. I'm now standing up, so my view is different. Um, I'm standing up. I'm a worker, I'm a sitter stander, and you called on me and I was standing up. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I learned a lot, especially with um, the timings in the presentations and the camera view. I've sat in several oral presentations and I've seen a whole gamut of different things. Um, you really touched on some important points. Um, specifically, the team that you're going to present, those are the important people. Like you said, you don't want your admin on there. You want to tell us that um, that detailed information and be very vocal and um, confident that you are the, the right supplier for HCC's needs. So um, I want to thank you both again for presenting to us. And as you said, this course was created through a survey. So if you have a business need, whether it's financials, marketing, HR, leadership, let us know, because we're working really hard to create and develop new programs to help you in those areas. So with that being said, our next webinar is to be determined. Stay on um, online with us, register on our constant contact, and then you'll be sure to get that email when it comes out. We're also gonna be sending out the recording um, along with the links to register as a vendor again and for our constant contact. And you'll also receive Julie and Susan's contact information. 
With that being said, ladies, thank you so much. Do you have any additional closing comments before we close for the day? Uh, we, I, I don't, I think we've covered everything. Um, we are actually presenting for HISD at the beginning right. of April. So watch our social media for updates on that presentation. Sounds like a plan. Thank awesome. you all stay safe and we will see you next time. If you have any questions, right. give us a call. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Stay, stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.